A graphic study of the man with the keys to the Kremlin and a leader who's cast a shadow over geopolitics for two decades now. Vladimir Putin is the subject of Daryl Cunningham's latest graphic novel, originally published as Putin's Russia, The Rise of a Dictator in English, and now in a French translation by Delcourt. Daryl joins us in the studio to tell us more about it. Hello. Hello. Now, to lift an excellent quote from your book, this is the story of a schoolyard bully who became a bureaucrat entrusted with a huge country, someone who's also described as a megalomaniacal dictator. Now, based on your extensive research into Putin's early life, were the clues all there in his childhood? Was this an inevitable trajectory for him? It does seem so when you read about his childhood, not just what he says, but what other people say who grew up with him who knew him as a child, that he was a very tough kid, that he was a smaller kid, that uh, it didn't stop him when he got into fights because he, he grew up in sort of, sort of rough tenements of what was then Leningrad. And after, not long after the uh, siege of Leningrad, the Second World War. So, and what we know about him is that he, he basically would, to, to win a fight, he would use any method. He would bite, he would scratch, you know, all the sort of norms you would think about, he would break. And it's still true today that the sort of political norms that we know, know of, he just ignores or breaks. Mm. Now, your graphic style, to come to the drawings here, it really captures Putin's features with no more than a few lines, that inscrutable expression that reveals uh, barely anything. Let's get an idea of the aesthetic of the book. <laughs> Now, it is an amazing and very subtle likeness there. How do you go about illustrating his mood, his attitude? Is his a difficult face to draw? Well, there, there are obviously no shortage of photographs of him, which photographic reference, and that's incredibly useful. I mean, in my previous books, they uh, were often much more cartoony. But with this book, I really wanted to do, because of the seriousness of much of the subjects, um, terrorism, warfare, assassination... Um, that I want to take a much more realistic approach to the drawing. So it's, it's, I've tried to get a more photographic approach, really. Mm, it really captures the likeness. Now, this book was published in English before the Russian invasion of Ukraine and the ensuing war. And as somebody who's followed Putin's geopolitical strategy for a while now, do you think that it was a bit short-sighted or naive of the international community not to see this coming or, or do more to prevent it? Absolutely. I mean, for 20 plus years, um, they've taken the approach that uh, Putin is like just your regular statesman, but he's not a regular statesman. He's an ex-KGB guy. He's like, um, basically, um, it's a crime cartel that's basically taken over an entire country. He's a mobster, and that's his approach, really. And you, can't, you can't really approach polit uh, Russian politics in the usual way. And your book recounts some of the terrifying things that happens to uh, Putin's opponents, uh, encounters with poisonous and radioactive substances, people mysteriously falling out of their apartment uh, buildings. A particularly shopping, shocking example is that of a journalist, Anna Politovskaya, who was killed in 2006. And she's one of seven Novaya Gazeta reporters to have been murdered since 2000. How do you judge a Russian feeling about the limits on press freedoms there? Are people actively seeking out information elsewhere? It's increasingly difficult for people inside Russia to get information, the true information. They're basically trying to disconnect themselves from the uh, internet now, really, and to be completely sealed off, much like North Korea. That seems to be the way they're going. And, of course, if you're critical of uh, Putin, uh, the Kremlin at all, you could easily end up in serious trouble. I mean, it's gone to ridiculous extremes where we've seen photographs of people holding up blank signs and being arrested. And recently, people holding up nothing at all being arrested. That's how surreal it's become. Those images are definitely quite striking. Now, beyond uh, politicians and the press, criticism of Putin has come from artists too. Now, Daryl, in your book, you uh, 
named the punk group Pussy Riot as people who are an anti-Kremlin voice. And elsewhere, anti-Kremlin voices have spoken out against those policies, often at great risk to their own safety. Uh, the Belarus Free Theatre was forced into exile last year after a number of their members were jailed, including co-founder Natalia Kaliada. She told us more about their latest production, Dogs of Europe, which was adapted from a dystopian novel and features some very timely themes. Here's more from her. That particular novel that is written by Algit Bakharevich in 2018 uh, spoke about how Russia built up a new Reich but by 2049. Uh, and uh, it's happened due to European indifference. Uh, it's happened uh, because Europe stopped reading books, um, lost critical thinking as a result of it, lost political will to stand up against uh, the major monster uh, from Kremlin. Now, in Belarus, there are more artists in jails than human rights defenders and journalists because dictators are afraid of morality and creativity because it means stories about them will stay forever in history because news disappear within hours these days. But when they're horrifying deals that they do now, convert it into the arts, it will be staying forever. An extract there of the dystopian play The Dogs of Europe performed at the Barbican in London in March. That will also be on show at the Grand Théâtre de Luxembourg in June. Now, Daryl, Natalia spoke there of the dangers to artists in Belarus, of being in jail herself, in fact. Were you fearful of the consequences when making this piece of work? Well, there are many, many books out on Putin in, in the West. So, I mean, this book is among many. And if you read the back of the book, you'll see many of the other books that I've read. So... Um, you know, no, I didn't really give it much thought, really. Obviously, I won't be going on a plane to Russia anytime soon, but um, I feel confident I'm fine, really. OK. Now, while your book focuses on the Russian president, another world leader who features is Donald Trump. Uh, you write that Trump aided and abetted Putin's attack on the US presidential election in 2016, or as the Mueller report uh, had it in 2019, that there was, quote, interference from Russia. Why do you think that was? Well, I think the evidence is uh, fairly overwhelming now that, that uh, the, the interests of uh, Trump and Putin aligned and they, there was some sort of uh, uh, confluence of interest between them. So, um, um, I mean, I set it out quite clearly in the book and Mueller himself stopped short of, of really, I think... Um, making it too clear, but um, I think it's there. OK. Well, a previous book of yours, Billionaires, looks into the lives of the world's wealthiest individuals, people like the Amazon CEO Jeff Bezos, uh, press tycoon Rupert Murdoch, among some others. Vladimir Putin almost definitely qualifies as one of the richest men in the world. You write that he could well be worth almost $200 billion, but much of that wealth is concealed, so it's impossible to be sure. How do you think that immense net worth affects or influences how he makes decisions? Well, it's a, a money is power. And one of the problems the West has is that we've become addicted to Russian money. And we see uh, places like New York and London basically working as sort of um, money laundering operations for the Russian state. And also, of course, uh, many uh, European countries are... Um, uh, have to use Russian oil, especially Germany. So we need to uh, detach ourselves from that and uh, because he's used this basically against us. Certainly something that's in the uh, political arena up for debate at the moment. Now, finally, to wrap up the show, we asked you for a cultural tip, something that's on your radar. You suggested a TV series called Severance. It's a bit of a disquieting version or vision of the work-life balance. Tell us why this one grabbed you. 
Well, it's a, it's a show in which um, um, it's a corporate, uh, some corporate workers uh, um, make the decision that they can separate their work and their work lives and their and their uh, uh, outside lives by severing their memories. So when they're in work, they can't remember what their outside life, lives are like, and when they're in work, they they. No, it's the other way around, sorry. <laughs> yeah, I think you get the idea that when they're in work, they don't know what their outside work is like, basically. So the the movie, the TV series explores these ideas of what identity is, what memory is, and and I think it's a really good um, exploration of what our lives are like in this sort of uh, corporate-owned, uh, fractured time that we live. Sounds suitably dystopian. Daryl Cunningham, thank you so much for joining us today. We'll leave you with a clip from Severance, which is available on Apple TV. Remember, you can get more arts and culture on our website. We're on social media too. There's more news coming up on France 24 just after this. My name is Petey. I'm from work. So we're friends? I'm your best friend. Nothing is what they say. I used to think it would take a monster to put someone in a place like that office, especially if the person was himself. If you want to know what's going on down there, you'll find the beginning of a very long answer. What's happening? What is it we actually do here? For nearly half a century, Cyprus has been cut in two. In the north, the Turkish Cypriot government and in the south, the Republic of Cyprus, Greek-speaking and Christian. Varosha, a former seaside resort and a symbol of the island's division, became a ghost town when it was abandoned by its inhabitants following the Turkish invasion in 1974. In 2019, Turkey reopened Varosha to tourists and to former residents. Long deprived of their right to return, they are now demanding the return of their property. C'est moi qui me bats pour l'instant, mais je sais pas combien d'années je peux encore me battre. Watch Varosha Revisited on France 24 and France24.com.